So this video was not exactly intended to be a video, which is why the footage is so weird. But, uh, why not turn it into a video? So I'll call this a lab note style video, because it's not exactly a procedure. Uh, and also the footage is bad. But anyways, today we'll be synthesizing potassium metapyridate. Now, sodium orthopyridate can be synthesized by running chlorine gas into a hot solution of sodium iodide and sodium hydroxide. Likewise, potassium metapyridate can be synthesized the same way. However, we get the metasalt, not the orthosalt, which is very interesting. Potassium just prefers it for some reason. So here's a hot solution of potassium hydroxide and potassium iodide, and I simply ran a random amount of chlorine gas into it. And eventually, after it stopped reacting, done. <laughs> Very simple synthesis, just sodium, uh, potassium iodide, potassium hydroxide, boil it and just run chlorine in. And then I evaporate the solution down to cover as much as possible. And now this stuff is not super soluble in water, so we can just filter right off. Very convenient. So here's our final product, and of course, wash with a little ice cold water, and then dry it on pump. And wash it again with more ice cold water to remove as much potassium hydroxide, potassium chloride, and potassium iodide as much. What? English. Ah, oh, I messed it up. Oh well. But yeah, so here's our final product. Very simple synthesis. It took like a few hours though. And you can see it is indeed some sort of potassium salt in the flame. Makes that lilac flame. A really nice color. Now, I was expecting to do something a bit more energetic, such as evolving oxygen and making this luminous flame into a nice blue flame, but it didn't. And I tried to use the wet product as an oxidant on some filter paper, but you can see it didn't really do much because it was wet. Now, to show you that this is oxidizing, though, I mixed it with some potassium iodide and added hydrochloric acid, and you can see it oxidizes it to iodine. So, here's our product after drying it a bit more on the pump. Nice fluffy powder and the iodine eventually coagulates. Now, if we, add it, uh, if we add it alone to hydrochloric acid, then it starts evolving chlorine gas as it oxidizes the hydrogen, uh, hydrochloric acid. So, that's interesting. C might be chlorine dioxide? I don't think it is, though. It just looks like chlorine to me. And there's also some iodine, of course, hence it's more yellow. So you can see diluting it down. Yeah, that looks like chlorine water to me. Now, I tried to bleach a uh, pH paper, but you can see it didn't really work. So, yeah. Not sure if it is chlorine dioxide or just chlorine still. But anyways, I'm going to try the final product further in the microwave because it's convenient. So, we're just going to microwave this for 10 seconds. Well, 10 second intervals. And in between that, we're going to blow a fan over it while shaking the beaker to dry it out. This method works quite well. So, here's our final dried product, and you can see it's quite heavy as I'm trying to demonstrate by throwing it up. Though I could probably just weigh it instead of doing this, but oh well. So now I want to recover the iodine from the waste. Now, there's not going to be much, but might as well try it. So here's our filtrate. I'm going to add hydrochloric acid to it to acidify it, because it's strongly basic still from potassium hydroxide. You can see it re-dissolves back in the iodine. Hooray! So we're going to need a reducing agent. I'm going to use ferrous chloride, because I don't have hydrogen peroxide, at least when I filmed it. So, um, ferrous chloride, I added it. You can see my ferrous chloride's quite oxidized already. Now, at first, it didn't really seem to do much, but after a few minutes, you can see some iodine starts precipitating. So, this reaction simply creates, um, ferric chloride and iodine. Now, again, like I said, my ferric, uh, ferrous chloride is already oxidized, so, uh, there's some crud mixed in, and, uh, we're gonna have to separate that somehow. But you can see it is oxidizing the iodine out. <laughs> Very cursed method. So I was going to solve the extract with dichloromethane, but again, the ferrous chloride has rust on it and it just clogs my um, sap funnel. So I'm going to filter it off really quick. And here you can see both the DCM solution, which is pink with the iodine, and the orange ferrous chloride um, filters through. And this solution, as you can guess, is quite dense. So now we're going to separate it again. This time, hopefully, won't clog the filter. And we're going to extract the dichloromethane until no more coloration is in the dichloromethane layer to remove as much iodine as I can. Now, the original plan was to separate the dichloromethane from the iodine by distillation. But I found that didn't really work well. So you can see the iodine dichloromethane solution. Very pretty. Nice wine color, but in dilute concentrations, a nice pink color. I swear, I still have to ampule various solutions of iodine in different solvents. So, yeah, I just couldn't stop having fun with it. Look at it, it's so 
pretty. The camera doesn't capture it well, but this is very pretty. Iodine is just pretty, usually, anyways, so, um, not too surprising, but <laughs> I'm very entertained by colors. Colors are fun. So here's our final dichloromethane iodine solution. We're going to dry it with some magnesium sulfate. Like I said, I wanted to separate it by distillation, but, uh, yeah, it didn't really work out too well. So here's our dichloromethane iodine solution. I'm going to filter it off, and you can see it's a nice pink color. Looks like wine. Really looks like wine. So we're going to try to distill dichloromethane off. Now, the issue is that the iodine also sublimes, or rather evaporates over, so it didn't really separate well. You can see we're getting a pink distillate. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. If I used a fraction column, I could probably get it to work, but oh well. So here's a concentrated solution of iodine and dichloromethane. Really pretty. Now after letting it cool overnight, you can see some iodine actually crystallize out. But this is not exactly a viable method. Like I said, the iodine goes away with the dichloromethane, so we can't really evaporate this down and get iodine crystals. So instead, I'm going to extract it off the dichloromethane layer by converting it into sodium iodide with sodium hydroxide solution. So I simply placed all of the dichloromethane iodine solution in a flask, added some sodium hydroxide solution, and shook it. So this will convert the iodine into iodate and iodide. Now, this is not the best method, of course. Now, of course, because we're converting into iodide, um, iodide and iodate, because we're using elemental iodine, we're going to have to reduce it to iodide somehow. And uh, my favorite reducing agent for reducing halogens is sodium metal bisulfite. Unlike sodium methyl sulfate, does not make sulfur tar. So here's our solution. Upper layers are sodium iodide, lower layers dichloromethane. So I separate it off. Dichloromethane layer, I dried it, and I'm going to reuse dichloromethane for future reactions. And here's our sodium iodide solution. You can see it's quite basic because it's sodium hydroxide. So first step is to acidify it. And you can see this does liberate some iodine, like I said, from the iodate reacting. But it slowly dissolves back in. Eventually, though, it got it completely acidified. Now, again, I don't have hydrogen peroxide to oxidize the iodide, so I used nitric acid as the oxidant. Very exotic. But it worked out very well. So, here's our final iodide solution. I let it cool in the fridge overnight, and we're going to filter it off to get our iodine. You can see there's some iodine subliming. Now, the reason why I'm recycling the iodine is because iodine's uh, it's not too cheap. I mean, the amount I recovered, it really probably isn't worth it for most people, but I like doing this kind of stuff. Now, to test our peridate, I mixed it a milligram of it with a milligram of magnesium powder, and you can see it makes quite a nice flash powder. Now, we do know this is periodate because it acts like perchlorate. It's stabilized with resonance, which means that simply touching a flame doesn't ignite it, but it fizzles for a little bit until it finally goes. Very similar to perchlorate. It's pretty stable. So yeah, there's our potassium metaperiodate. Uh, we might use this in a future video to make some metal complexes. But, uh, yeah. I mean, this is an interesting compound. I don't think anyone has shown how to synthesize this on YouTube yet. So, um, there you go. Yeah.